Given that we know something about the basic process model uh, that is fundamental to every process we're using in our system, now we're going to address the issue of characterizing that process in terms of how capable is it, uh, and by capable we mean performance, uh, to achieve the intended outcomes as described in the design specification. So here's an interesting example about an engine cowling. Uh, and this work comes from uh, Sanchez et al., uh, who uh, published a paper on a methodology for assessing manufacturing costs due to tolerance of aerodynamic surface features on turbofan nacelles. Uh, if you're not familiar with an engine cowling, think of it as the wrapper around the engine. And as you can see in this figure, there are a variety of components that go into the uh, total cowling. So we have formed pieces formed on a press that are created to enclose the engine. And in terms of the aerodynamics of the engine, of course, you don't want to create uh, unnecessary drag uh, based upon the fitting of each panel to the uh, engine. And so what they did was they characterized the nature of deviations, because again, when we think about our process, we should think about it in terms of how does this deviate from nominal. So here are the potential deviations that they identified. Uh, first of all, at the joints, there could be steps, which means that we are not perfectly matched in terms of the panels, or there could be actual gaps, uh, a spread between panels. For fasteners, the fastener may not be perfectly seated, and so there's some variation in the degree to which the fasteners are seated against the surface. And then finally, the actual shape, which you're already familiar with through profile tolerances, uh, doesn't match up with the design spec. So let's look at the joints first, and here in this figure, what you see is the direction of airflow over the panel, and by step, we're saying the step is negative if the next panel is lower than the previous panel, again, in the direction of airflow. And so this step, or this delta, represents some deviation because ideally you would want it to be perfectly continuous. Uh, the other problem would be a step where we have, again, in the direction of airflow, a step up, or in a positive direction, where again the panels do not match perfectly so we don't get a continuous surface. And then in terms of uh, orienting the panel with respect to the airflow, so that this is represents the joint between two panels, you can see what's happening here. We also have a step, but that step is in the direction of the airflow. And so that will create a different effect than when the step is normal to the airflow. Uh, the second issue was the gap. And if you look at the gap here again, this represents the joint between two panels. We have a delta. Ideally, there would be zero gap. If we look at it uh, normal to the airflow, again, the airflow moving in this direction, we see this gap again, a dip, and then it comes up again. Well, think of our process in terms of assembling this cowling as producing deviations, and those deviations represent changes in the gap as well as the step. Uh, the second one was fasteners, and here's an example of a fastener seated against uh, two panels. And you can see that it's not perfectly seated, so we get this delta on both sides of the fastener. Uh, the last type of deviation, which you are already used to, and that is, what about the profile of the panel itself? So there we're talking about shape, and you can think of this as your profile tolerance zone. So you're hoping that the panel is going to lie within your tolerance zone. Of course, the tighter that tolerance zone, then the less deviation is allowed. So we need to think about our process as uh, something that produces deviations in the final output. Again, that determination will help you decide whether or not it's scrap that needs to be reworked or sent to the waste stream, or whether it's a good component and it can proceed to the next step in the process. In order to characterize it, we use the term process capability, which is essentially saying uh, 
how well does the process perform in terms of producing the desired outcome. So what we'll do, we'll treat each product attribute, such as the gap or the step, uh, whatever it is that we can use to characterize uh, the potential deviation, and treat that as a continuous random variable. And that represents a trial every time we produce uh, or go through that process and change something about our product, we're going to get one instance, one occurrence of, or one observation of that random variable. <clears throat> then what we'd like to do is determine the distribution of that random variable. And as you know, the distribution is going to show you the spread of your deviations over some range. And that spread corresponds to variation, which we're concerned about because again, we have specific limits of the distribution and those limits tell us something about whether or not our uh, parts are going to fall within specification. So we'll characterize deviations from some nominal value. For instance, in the gap, we could say the nominal value is zero. And then as the gap increases, we will deviate from zero. If I think of the probability distribution, I'm thinking of the likelihood of falling within some range. So if you've got a normal distribution, looks something like that, you know that the area under this curve is telling you the probability of being in some range here. And that's really the basis of process capability. Now, typically what we do is we assume that these attributes, such as the gap or the step, have some normal distribution. And then we need to come up with a number that tells us something about how well this process performs. So a simple approach would be to take uh, our mean, plus or minus three sigma, and say that that somehow represents our process capability. So if this is a normal distribution and this is mu, then we're going to look in both directions, plus or minus three sigma, or you think of that total range as the magic six sigma. Well, that really uh, will not be sufficient to describe what's going on. So a variety of indices have been proposed to try to further characterize that process capability. The simple process capability index, or CP, will take our tolerance range. And again, this could be dimensional. Tolerances that you're already familiar with. These could be geometric tolerances. It represents a uh, width or range in which this attribute must fall. And then in the denominator, this represents our process. So you can see what we're trying to do with this index. Represent the design spec in the numerator, the process in the denominator. And we're saying that this six sigma range should correspond to the tolerance range that the designer specified. <clears throat> well, we don't know what sigma is offhand, so what we could do is estimate sigma with, as you know, the sample standard deviation, S. And the way we would do that, obviously, is put a bunch of parts through the process, measure the attributes, measure the deviation, and then calculate S based on the uh, formula for sample standard deviation. Well, if we look at this process capability index, or CP, we note that when it's one, that corresponds to a range of six sigma. And then if we look in <coughs> the standard normal table, telling us something about the probability, plus or minus three sigma, what we note is that we have 2,700 defects, in other words, outside the range, uh, per million. So this is parts per million. If I look at in terms of percent defects, it's going to be 0.27. So I have a fairly small probability that we're going to have a defect, but it is not insignificant, especially if our production volume is large. Well, as we increase CP, what we see is a dramatic reduction in the number of defects. So this is suggesting that we want to uh, have a process that it has a very tight uh, sigma value because what that will do is decrease the likelihood of defects. Conversely, if the CP is less than one, you're going to have major problems. <clears throat>
So processes with CPs less than one need a lot of attention to bring them up to a value that's going to be acceptable. There's also a point of diminishing return, as you can expect, as we try to tighten up our ratio here between the tolerance range and our process, it is going to cost more as we try to increase our process, process capability index. And of course, at some point, we're not going to get much benefit from that. It's just going to add to the cost of our product. Another popular index is what's called the CPK. And in the previous index, we did not take into account the location. By location, we did not consider where mu was. We only considered plus or minus three sigma. The problem there is we could be off in terms of some offset, right? So think of a dimensional tolerance. We could be off by a significant amount from the nominal. And yet our range plus or minus three sigma would give us a CP greater than one. So with the CPK, we're trying to take into account the fact that uh, we might not be centered on that nominal. We could be skewed. In other words, asymmetric, it might not be a normal distribution. And again, we'll estimate the mean and standard deviation. And now we'll use that location, our mean, in the numerator and subtract that from the upper tolerance level. And then the other corresponding side will subtract our smallest tolerance level from that mean. And then we'll divide through both of those by 3s. Well, of course, if we're centered, and this is right in the middle of the tolerance range, uh, then we're going to end up with CP equal to CPK. But as X bar moves off of that middle, right, what's going to happen is we'll get different values for these two. And we're going to err on the um, conservative side and say that let's take that smallest width, in other words, the ratio, and use that Otherwise, we might bias our perception of the process. So we take the minimum value of these two, and that gives us our CPK. So that will tend to be less than our CP uh, when, again, we are not located, our mean is not located at the nominal. So let's take a look at some uh, processes that you might be familiar with from 248. Uh, shaping process, we've got a cutting tool and essentially, uh, it's moving in a linear fashion in a plane and removing material. So we look at this and we ask ourselves a question, is this a normal distribution? Is it symmetric? And uh, that would be difficult to argue because it seems skewed towards the left, right? So in this case, our CP will not be equal to CPK. Grinding process, uh, and if I look at a grinding process, again, this is a secondary process. It's not surprising that we do get more of a normal distribution here, and that if this is zero, that's the surface we're trying to achieve, it's not unusual for us to be offset from that because we didn't remove all of the material. But you can see the problem here is if zero is where the mean should be, and our x bar is here, then we might say this process is quite capable in terms of CP because that doesn't take into account the mean. But when we calculate CPK, that might change everything. Okay, So again, the location, if that's important, then we're going to look at CPK. Fly cutting process, now this one looks uh, quite normal in terms of the distribution. And it's normal around zero, so it's very likely that CP will be essentially equivalent to CPK. Here's an end mill process. Again, you're familiar with uh, that machining process. If I look at the distribution, again, it looks quite normal, and the mean is very close to zero. So here again, the CP will probably be very close to CPK. You're not going to see much of a difference there. Uh, now we have a boring process. We're, we're boring out a hole, a cylindrical surface. 
And here, as you can see, we've got a very skewed distribution. And so we would definitely want to use CPK in this case. Most of our values are negative, and it does not look like a normal distribution, so it will not be symmetric with respect to the designer's intent if they were thinking that these deviations were going to have a normal distribution. And so this would essentially create a tail effect and could potentially cause a significant percentage of our parts to be outside of specification depending upon the width of that upper tolerance zone and lower tolerance zone. Well, as we've seen in these examples, uh, it's not good to assume normal distribution. So how could you determine whether or not your results from your process indicate that you have a normal distribution or some other distribution? Probability plots are used quite often to make that determination. Essentially, we'll come up with our hypothesis about a distribution function such as normal or uh, log normal, whatever it might be, and we'll compare it with actual outcomes where we collect data from our process. Typically what you're doing is you're plotting quantile values, and if you recall quantile values have to do with the probability of a uh, data point being less than or equal to some value. And we'll do that for the observed quantile versus some theoretical quantile. In these probability plots, you should get a straight line. And departures from straight line mean that perhaps you have the wrong distribution or you have insufficient data to reach a conclusion. So let's look at a simple QQ plot. Here we'll take our data points. Again, in this context, the data points are the uh, product attributes that we have measured after going through the process, and we'll take those numbers and sort them in ascending order. So you could do that in Excel. And then we'll calculate the quantiles. So think of that as the probability of having a value less than the observed value. And to calculate quantiles, we'll use this. I is the number in terms of the index, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So which data point are we looking at? And then we subtract 0 0.5 and divide through by n. This is the total number of points. So for each i, you can see what's going to happen is i increases, then this quantile or prob cumulative probability is increasing until we reach uh, close to the value of n. Then what we'll do is, based on the distribution that we've selected, such as the normal distribution, we'll calculate the theoretical values based upon these probabilities. And then we'll pot, plot those uh, theoretical values versus the sorted actual values. In other words, they should match if this fits that distribution. So if you think about what we're doing, we're saying if the distribution we've selected, such as the normal, is correct, what should the actual values have been for a given quantile? So let's look at an example. Here we have a uh, n-mill example, and I've taken the deviations from nominal, and I've sorted them from uh, largest or smallest to largest in ascending order. And then I took these, and we have, uh, in this case, turns out that n is equal to 24. So what we'll do is we'll just number these. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so forth, and calculate i minus 0 0.5 over n to come up with quantiles. We're also using estimates of the parameters of the normal distribution uh, based upon the standard estimates x bar and s for the standard deviation. We need these because we're going to have to uh, calculate the, what these values should have been if, in fact, we have a normal distribution with these parameters. So that's what I did next. Here are the quantiles representing the probabilities of having a number less than, so this is a 0 0.021 probability that the number will be less than 7.9. And of course, we're in ascending order, so you can see what's happening here. Our probabilities goes up as we get to uh, the last observed data. Using the normal distribution and these probabilities, we can just use the normal inverse function in Excel or something similar and come up with a theoretical deviation. By that we mean we got a value of 7.9, but based on this probability, 
if it's a normal distribution with those parameters, we should have gotten a value of 6.1. And so this is theoretical in the sense of, is this a good fit? So are these matching up in terms of a linear function? Again, plotting this column. This is what we should have gotten versus this is what we actually got when we collected our data. So when we plot that, we get something that looks like this. So what can we conclude from our QQ plot? Well, you should have some concern because we said initially, if it's a good fit, then this should just be a straight line indicating that we got what we expected. But as you can see here, it, that is curving about a straight line. And we have two possibilities at this point. One is we have insufficient data, or perhaps we collected the data incorrectly, or it's other than a normal distribution. And so we might evaluate other distributions and see if we have a better fit. The other uh, probability plot is related to the QQ plot, but it's based upon probabilities, not the theoretical values versus actual values. And this is called the PP plot. Essentially, we'll do the same or similar process in terms of sorting the data, calculating the quantiles in the same way. But now what we'll do is something a little different. Instead of calculating the theoretical deviations, we'll calculate the theoretical probability based upon each actual value that we observed. So what we're going to do is compare the quantile versus what the theoretical probability should have been. In other words, if everything's perfect, these two should match up. They should be equivalent, and therefore you should get a straight line for each observed data point. Of course, that's not going to happen. You'll get some slight perturbations. Uh, but you get the idea we're trying to correspond what the probability should have been versus what the quantile is telling us in terms of probability. So we plot those two. Again, if the distribution is correct, what should the quantile values be based on the distribution parameters? In other words, these quantiles should correspond directly to the theoretical probability. And so that's what I did. I took the same numbers. If you, we look at the table here, Again, these numbers have not changed. They're exactly the same for the set of values. And now what I do is I actually find the probability, and we, you could do that in something like Excel or MATLAB. There are functions that return to you the probability for getting a value less than or equal to that value. So what we're saying here, what's the probability that X, and specifically this value here, is less than 7.9. That's what we mean by this theoretical probability. So we can look that up in tables or use a function in something like Excel or MATLAB, and we come back with 0.150, which is not the same as what we get with the quantile. So these two values should match up, and as you can see, they're not exactly the same. So we plot that to see if it's linear. Again, we see that this plot isn't exactly linear, so we would have some concerns about that data. In other words, that data is either insufficient, incorrect, or the data does not fit the distribution that we thought it would. Note what's being plotted on the y-axis, the theoretical probabilities based upon the data observed, and these are the quantiles, the i minus 0.5 divided by n. So, in conclusion here, when you're using these probability plots, you can't forget what the goal is. You're trying to determine whether or not your process capability is following a certain distribution. The QQ plot and the PP plot tell you different things. The QQ plot, that will tend to identify differences that you see in the tails of the distribution. So, if the tails of the distribution are important, you want to focus on the QQ plot. For the PP plot, it's going to accentuate the differences in the middle of the distribution. So if you think about a distribution, this would tell you more about the shape of the distribution, whereas this tells you more about what's happening at the tails of the distribution. So if you've matched up the shape correctly, you might 
see good results here in the PP plot. But in terms of process capability, we would certainly be interested in the tails of the distribution because remember, we're looking at plus or minus three sigma and the location of those are toward the tails of the distribution. So if we don't have a good fit, again, we're going to have some problems depending upon the indices that we use. In summary, when we think of process capability, it's not just calculating a magic index such as CPK and saying, oh, the CPK is greater than one, therefore we have a good process. You really want to understand the distribution of deviations in a given process and use that to characterize what's going to happen. Now think about the scrap rate S. How does that relate to what we're talking about? Uh, and don't confuse this with standard deviation, but we're talking scrap rate right now. How does that relate to the process capability and this distribution? Well, note if this represents our tolerance range, anything outside that range is a defect. So we're going to reject anything outside that range, and therefore S corresponds to the probability at this tail end plus the probability at this tail end. And you know how to look that up in a table or in Excel. Uh, you can determine S directly uh, before you start producing parts if you understand the process capability.